Well, good morning, Walden Church. Here we are once again. It's Sunday. Again. It's the beginning of the week. Again. You're here for another church service. Again. And, and for most of you, you'll have a nice Sunday. And perhaps after church, a few of, a, uh, of you will come up to me afterwards and say, that was good. Or, or you and your spouse, you know, will talk on the way home from church and you'll say, that was good. Don't you think Sunday morning was good? And I like that. I want you to feel good. But today, I would like for us to consider that I hope it's God, right? That, that it's God that looks at what we do and he says, wow, that was good right? Because right now he is the audience and we have come here on another Sunday for another church service to worship him. Church is not to please us. It's to please him and we can't ever lose sight of that. Like if you were a small business owner, you would probably had a reason that you began your company. You said, I'm gonna set out to do this. this. This is our business model, this is our plan, right? I'm gonna do this. Your company has a model, it has a direction. Oftentimes, if the company does well, then the temptation is to change direction because now that you're doing well, you're looking at dollar signs and not clients, and you divert the company from the original model to pursue more dollars. Sometimes that works, especially if the company really never found its footing. But more often than not, if a company changes midway, it fails. That's a death sentence for a company to change direction. That should never happen here. Should never happen at a church because we, we have the model for what we do right there in the Bible. Right? We have the source document. We have the road map always with us. If we ever lose sight of our direction, we should always be able to go back to the Bible. In the book of Malachi, the Israelites have lost their direction. Not physically on the road, but spiritually. They were getting kind of loose and casual with their relationship with God. And as such, they were getting loose and casual with their worship. Malachi is the last Hebrew book in the Old Testament. And in that book, he warns his people, especially the priests. He says, return to me. Because after Malachi, after that last book in the Old Testament, 400 years of silence. 400 years. So, so God is serious, right? And if you've ever wondered why the Protestant Bible doesn't contain all the apocryphal books, that's why. Because the Apocrypha, those books were written, yes, but you don't have them in your Bible because those books are only history. They're only history. They're just a story of the Jews in that 400 year period. But God is not a character in those books. God is silent for 400 years. Look at the very last paragraph of the book of Malachi. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will return the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So God says, this is going to be the very next sign you see. After me speaking right now, in 400 years, the next thing you will see is a prophet. That prophet will look like Elijah, and he will come before the Lord comes. Well, who was that prophet? John the Baptist. So the previous four chapters in Malachi are about how Israel was losing their enthusiasm, losing their vigor, how they're just kind of casually worshiping. And so God tries. He tries to stir some fire and some passion back into their worship. He says, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, 
Where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name? God says at the start of all of this, you call me father. You call me father. Well, guess what? A child honors their parent. And in a home, children show respect to their parents. They obey their parents. And likewise, he said, you also call me master. Then again, where is my honor? Where is my respect? Think about the words that we use when we address God in our prayers, the titles we give him. And right here in chapter one, God lists two of those, Father and Master. Those words have meaning to you, don't they? Well, they have meaning to God. And God says, if you use those words to address me, then your actions should back them up. We pray master, we pray Lord, but is that how I treat him? Do I treat him as master? Or do I treat him as slave? Are my prayers just, uh, God, do this for me. God, do that for me. God, why haven't you done this for me? Father and master are titles of respect. So we need to respect him. We pray Father and Lord, but, but there is respect and worship that go with those titles. Jesus says the very same thing in Luke chapter six. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Same exact thing, right? So the book of Malachi, which is the last official word of God in their Hebrew texts, says exactly what Jesus is now saying in the New Testament. He's ringing that same bell. Jesus says, stop calling me that if you are not going to do what I tell you. The prophet Malachi says, when you do that, you despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will they accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, we will show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts. God starts off and says, you insult me. And the priests say, how? How have we insulted you? And God says, you have polluted my altar. What an insult. Sacrifices are supposed to be you bringing your very best, right? The scriptures told them, gave them instructions, perfect animals, without blemish, no spots, good, clean animals, your very best. Hebrew children were not even allowed to name their very best animals, because you don't want to get attached to those. Your perfect and best animal, you save for God. That, that animal belongs to God. And God says, you have gotten lazy. You've gotten lazy. You bring me sick animals, blind animals, animals that you didn't even want anyway. You're giving God scraps. You're giving God leftovers. You're supposed to bring your best. You know, when you're looking at the, the pen and you're trying to decide which animal to bring, you should already know. It shouldn't be a choice, right? Instead, you're looking at them and going, oh, well, that one keeps spinning in circles a lot. We don't know why. Kind of got screw loose, maybe. We'll, we'll take him. Oh, that one over there that, you know, was born with a, one leg missing. We'll take that one. And you think God won't notice. And you think God won't care. Or you think God will just say, well, you know, they tried. How do you bring a sacrifice if it's not a sacrifice? If you're bringing something that doesn't cost you anything, you're bringing God basically your garbage. It should cost you something. When God sacrificed his son, it cost him something. And you say, no, 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 you know, God... God's pleased with anything I do. He's fine. No, you're wrong. 
That's disobedience. God says, hey, you know what? I know you think it's okay to do that with me. Why don't you try that with your governor? Just try to pull that, pull that stunt when you pay your taxes. Anybody not filed your taxes yet? Probably most of us, right? We're not, yeah, of course, of course. How about this? Instead, let's just, let's just try this. Don't, 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 uh, don't do your taxes. Instead, you know what you should do is you should just, uh, just write any old number, any old number that, you know, you think is fair. So, you know, see, just see if the IRS is, is cool with that, okay? Just give them just whatever you think they're due, okay? And, and they'll be fine with that, right? Because they'll, they'll look at that and they'll say, oh, well, you know, oh, he, they're trying. They're, that, at least it's something, right? Hey, at least it's something. You, that you think the IRS is going to be happy with that? Or don't even give them money. Don't give them money. Instead, what you should do is go out to the garage and find that box that you're saving to give to the thrift store. Find that box that you're saving for the next garage sale. Give them that. See if the government wants your old baby clothes and your old uh, Tom Clancy novels and your power sander that sometimes works and, and all your old music CDs. See if the IRS takes that. You think your government will be satisfied when you go to pay your taxes? Do you think they'll get that box and say, well, <laughs> at least it's something? No. God says, if you are not brave enough to try that with your government, why do you pull that with me? I wonder how different we are. I mean, sure, we're not bringing blind animals or lame animals, but are we bringing God our first? Are we bringing God our best? We do this with our money and our house and our car, and, and then we spend the money on the stuff we want, and we go on the vacation we want, and then we look and we say, well, is there any money left over? We'll give that money to God. And we think God's cool with that. We, th we think God is rejoicing. Yay! They, they tried. They gave me something. Oh, this is more than some people. And, and God says through Malachi, isn't that evil? You think I'm rejoicing over scraps? I, you know, I watch you go to work. I watch you hang out with your kids. I watch you hang out with your spouse. I watch, watch you, you know, you're, you, as you watch TV and, you, and then you go off and exercise. And then at the end of the day, when you're super duper tired and your head, hit, head hits the pillow, and then you start your prayer as you begin to just drift off to sleep. You just kind of throw me the last five minutes of your day. You just give me a, a scrap. You just throw me a bone, right? You ever heard that expression? Throw me a bone? God doesn't want your bones. He doesn't want your scraps. He doesn't want your leftovers. I mean, what are we thinking when we live that way? Are we just thinking that God's in heaven going, oh, thanks, just what I, just what I always wanted from my child, the last five minutes of your day. Look what God says next. Oh, that there were one among you who had shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. You know what that means? You know what that means? God says, I wish someone would just close the door to the temple. I wish that church would just close their doors forever. I'd rather that there be no worship there than for them to worship me like that. God would rather we not worship him at all than insult him. Isn't God the best? I mean, come on, right? Isn't God the best? Then doesn't he deserve our best? I mean, think about that, what he just said. In America, there are thousands of churches, thousands. And I wonder how many of those churches are going to close their doors this year. How many of the altars will be shut down? Average study says 4,000. 4,000 churches close their door every year. I don't need to go to a church 
that tells me how good I am. I don't need to go to a church where we all just feel good about ourselves. I want to go to a church where we tell God how great he is. I want God to look at us and say, wow, that was worship. That Sunday, that, that was my favorite. I want God to say that was my favorite Sunday. God looks forward to Sunday. God looks forward to Sunday. We should too. Do you spring out of bed Sunday morning? Or do you lazily grab a cup of coffee and say, oh, here we go again. Isn't God the best God? <laughs> he thinks so. He says in Malachi verse 11, for from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. God says, I'm great. <laughs> God says it. He says, I'm, I'm great. And if you, if you don't worship me with praise, you know what? The rest of the nations will. The rest of the world will. God says all over, all over, people are worshiping me correctly with respect and reverence. You know, two weeks ago, we were talking about how big God is and how awesome he is and how God is, is this, this being who dwells in, in mystery and unapproachable light and he spoke all things into existence and we can't even fathom, right? The Bible says we can't even fathom everything there is to know about him. And today, today is the day we set aside to worship him. How did you come to worship today? What have you brought? What are you coming with? Is it your first? Is it your best? God says, my name will be great among the nations. So, so I can't be casual when I come here. I can't lip sync the music or critique the songs or say, oh, I wish the songs were slower. I wish the songs were faster. I wish the songs were older and classic. I, I wish the songs were newer. I wish the music was louder. I wish the music was quieter. I wish the sermon was longer. I wish the sermon was shorter. None of this is for me. None of this is for me. Worship on Sunday starts the moment I leave the house. It starts the moment I get up. I can't spend my morning yelling at my kids or in a fight with my spouse or having impure thoughts because before I walk through the back, before I walk through those church doors, sure, sure church is only a couple of hours, but I need to make sure that I'm giving God my whole day, right? This is the Sabbath. And the Sabbath belongs to him. This is his day, the whole day. And I know we're in Malachi today, and this might sound like Old Testament God, right? And, and sometimes we think it like that. We think, well, you know, the God in the Old Testament was mean. Or the God in the Old Testament was kind of grumpy, but then he had a kid and he kind of mellowed out. That's, that's, not, that's not true. Look what, look what uh, Malachi chapter 3 says. He says, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. I would just challenge you uh, this week. You know, if you're not in a particular study right now, if you're not reading anything, uh, go home and read Malachi this week. It's, it's only four chapters. It'll take you like 20, 25 minutes, right? What did God just say? He doesn't change. He doesn't change. But notice he also says, it's not too late. He says, all you need to do is return to me and I will return to you. That's all he's saying, come back. You've drifted, you've diverted, you've gone off course. You're getting a little sloppy. You're getting a little lazy. You're getting a little lax. That's what Jesus says. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? You don't do what I tell you. Augustine said Jesus Christ is not valued at all until he is valued above all. 
All through this passage, Malachi has been referring to God as Lord. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord? Now the Jews, they would have only used that word, Lord, for God. So if you believed in Jesus and you call him Lord, you're saying that Jesus is God. The Lord is God. The Lord is God. Look what Paul writes in Philippians. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus has the name that is above every name. There's only one name that's above all names, and that's God. Gentiles would have seen the term Lord very differently because for Gentiles, Lord was something that you called the emperor. And it was used to express your allegiance and your loyalty to Rome. And if a Gentile believed in Jesus and a Gentile calls him Lord, then they are proclaiming commitment and allegiance to Jesus above Rome. So if Jesus is Lord, Jesus is God, Jesus is fully divine, he's fully human, he is the bridge that spans the gap between God and humanity, which also means Jesus deserves our full commitment. And he is the only one who deserves our loyalty and our worship. The Bible says the Lord is exalted. Philippians uh, verse 9 says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place. Jesus has been exalted. That's another church word, right? Exalted. What, is, what does exalted mean? Well, it means somebody who goes from rags to riches. Somebody who goes from pauper to king. Philippians says Jesus humbled himself, came to earth in the form of a person. He left the glory of heaven and he came to the poverty of earth. He gave up a kingship to become a servant. He was a creator who became part of creation. Jesus humbled himself, Paul says, to the point of death. And Jesus followed that path that the Father had given him all the way to the cross. And the Greek word that Paul uses in Philippians for exalt means that you are exalting forever. It's a continuous word. It means it goes on into infinity. The literal, literal understanding of this is that Jesus has been raised from a humble place he has become the dying servant, and now his position is as living Lord, living Lord forever. Paul also says the Lord holds the highest place. Since God has exalted Jesus supremely, we understand that he has ultimate authority. Jesus has been given leadership over all of creation, everything. There is no name that is above his, and there is no authority that is above his. There is no position that is above his. There is no power that is above his. Jesus is above all. He is beyond all. Our passage in Philippians says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. I get it. We don't bow in America. We don't, we don't bow here in the West. And what that is, of course, is submission. It's submission, it's worship. It's an act of giving personal praise. It's an act of declaring submission, declaring uh, your, your personal will is submitted to the king. But this passage that Paul writes says one day, one day, every person, every person, mind and body will bow one day, every belief, every creed, every religion will bow. One day, every man, woman, and child will bow. It also says the Lord will be proclaimed, right? Every tongue will confess. Every person will declare Jesus is Lord. Every single person living and dead will give absolute, positive confession that Jesus is Lord. Revelation gives us a glimpse of what that looks like. In Revelation chapter 5, it says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Revelation chapter 15 says, Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? 
For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. That means every nation. Every nation, every tongue, every language will confess. One day, every race, every color, every shape of person will confess. One day, every king, every leader and authority will confess. From Adam and Eve to the last human alive, from the greatest to the weakest, from the richest to the poorest, from the Christian to the Muslim, from the most faithful to the most wicked, everyone is going to bow. Everyone is going to proclaim the lordship of Jesus. The Lord is coming again. And the Lord is coming again. He says, behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus says he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning and the end. But those are not his only titles. Jesus is the Son of David, the Son of Man, the Son of God. Jesus is the light of the world. He is the Lion of Judah. He is the Good Shepherd. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, the Lamb of God, the Suffering Servant. Jesus is the one who was and is and is to come. Jesus is the living water, the bread of life, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, and the life. He is the chief cornerstone, the capstone that was rejected. He is the great I am. Jesus is the great prophet, the high priest and king. Jesus is the prince of peace, the wonderful counselor. He is Messiah. He is Christ. And he is the anointed son of God. I want to show you a newspaper from 1912. This is page 126. This is an article about Queen Victoria, but Queen Victoria was crowned June 28th, 1838, which means this newspaper is 74 years removed from that. This, this article was written 74 years later. So this story is about Queen Victoria's coronation week. And the story is so beautiful. And the story is so ingrained in the people's thoughts that the story was run again. 74 years later. It says, When Queen Victoria sat in her coronation week in the royal box while Handel's Messiah was being played, the lady-in-waiting went to her and said, Everyone in the room, when they reach the Hallelujah Chorus, will rise and stand till the music ceases except the Queen. It was the royal etiquette that the Queen should keep her seat. The music continued, sweeter and fuller, sweet enough for heaven, I think. And when the hallelujah chorus was reached, the people rose and stood with bowed heads, and it was noticed that the queen was deeply moved. Her lips quivered, her eyes filled with tears, her body trembled until they came to that burst of melody, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then in spite of royal etiquette, the young queen stood up and with bowed head remained standing until the music ceased. A nobler, queenlier thing she never did. Jesus is king of kings. Jesus is Lord of lords and he shall reign forever and ever. King of kings, Lord of lords. That's why we're here again. That's why we've gathered on another Sunday again at the beginning of the week again to worship him and to give him our best. Let's pray. Lord, as Handel wrote so eloquently, King of kings, Lord of lords, and he shall reign forever and ever. Jesus is Lord. He is Lord over my life. He is Lord over this world. 
He is Lord over my state, my government. He is Lord over my friends and family. He is Lord over all creation. He is Lord of the universe. Everything is his. He is mighty. He is powerful. He is all-knowing, all-loving, all-gracious, all-forgiving. All majesty belongs to him. All worship belongs to him. All reverence. Each one with bowed faces, each one on bended knee, we worship you. King of kings, Lord of lords. Amen. I know it feels like for a couple weeks now, I've just been on this pattern about talking about worship and God and how big he is and how much of a responsibility we have to worship him. I don't want you to feel guilty or feel like you've fallen short lately. I would just remind you that, you know, your local church is right around the corner. At any time, at any moment, you can go and walk through those doors and sit next to other brothers and sisters in faith. And you can share in that Sabbath morning. So I would just encourage you. You know, I, I think we need this as a collective. I think we need this as a fellowship. I think we need this as the body of Christ, to be the body sitting next to other believers. We have nothing to fear, nothing. Your God is Lord of all things, and he holds all things in his hands, and he is in control of all things. And he has asked that Sunday be the Sabbath, that we set it aside to worship him and to love him. And so I would just continue to invite you. Come, come, find your local church, plug in, serve, be a part of it, offer your talents and your gifts, bring the things that God has given you as your very best to serve him and to worship him. That is why God made you, and that is when we feel most alive. I love you guys. I'll see you next week.